Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Brian Thatcher, and welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's a show that aims to provide hope and avenue for healing, and one that will help you better understand and then live the great mercy of God. With me today, I have a special guest. You know, many people in the world work just to put food on the table, day after day monotony. And uh, Michael McGlynn is a little different. He's got many skills and talents, and he's using those to build up the kingdom of God. He's done a lot of work with the Marians. And we're going to talk about his skills, his work before as he was in college and, and what led him into all this. And he has a great love for the Eucharist as well. Um, he's from Kansas City, Missouri. He's a filmmaker, recording artist, and uh, founder of Sistine Films. And uh, hoping he can show us a little of his work today. Ask him to come on the show and uh, tell us why he loves what he's doing. Uh, so, Michael, welcome to Mercy Unbound. It's great to be here, Dr. Thatcher. Thank you. I've heard so much about your work over the years. I remember many years ago, my first trip up to Stockbridge and being greeted by Father Kaz and having this idea of wanting to help the Marians out with video and it wasn't the right time. And But he's told me, he said, look, we've got two apostolates already. And this third one that you want to do, he says, it's better that you remain separate because of the creative nature of being freed up. But of course, one of them being yours and the work you've done. So it's a great joy to be with you. You know, it's interesting. We're kind of a polar opposites because I was a, a math and science guy and my thinking is very concrete. So my creativity side is, has been asleep for most of my life. But it's a joy to meet someone like you who's uh, putting out such beautiful work. But let's just start with, tell us about uh, yourself and where you grew up and about your faith walk and what are you up to? Yeah, well, I'll give a give a quick week recap. I'm, as you mentioned, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, grateful to have both of my parents still alive. Been married uh, going on 24 years this summer, um, not counting the nine and a half years we dated long distance. So that's awesome. Uh, Beth and I are raising a family here in Kansas City, two kiddos in college, and one daughter in high school. So we have a really beautiful marriage and, and friendship and family. In 1990, I was awarded with a scholarship to go play football at the University of Notre Dame under legendary coach Lou Holtz. And from afar, that might seem like an incredible gift, and it was. I wanted to go pursue music full time, and uh, sports really wasn't my currency, music was. But I really wanted to be obedient to my parents, and so I, I chose that. Uh, school to go to. I had scholarships everywhere. The, the, the opportunities were insane. And this was part of my dilemma as a guy that was decorated with crazy honors that I didn't feel were warranted. And I get to this premier program in 1990, and I don't feel like I belong there. I'm an offensive lineman vowing for a you know, position to play on the team and all these sorts of things. And we had a great team while I was there. In any event, it was in my sophomore year, though, actually, that I made some decisions that uh, really weren't good for me and anyone else, and, and they resulted in me having to kind of take a look at my life in a bigger way. I missed a flight to Hawaii is the big thing that happened. <laughs> and it's one thing to miss a bus down the road, but when you miss a flight to Hawaii to go play, that's a big deal. In any event, uh, fast forward through all of that, it was going into that spring of that year, my sophomore year, that... Uh, a friend of mine gave me a book on a Marian vision site and apparition site, and it led me to then begin to pick up the rosary. I had lost my grandmother that year. I was very close to her. She always had a rosary in hand, and I started to pray the rosary. And really, from that point on in my life, I didn't have prayer in my toolbox, and I was collapsing, collapsing under the weight of academic and athletic pressures. From that point forward, Mary began to walk me through this Notre Dame experience. I went on to start the next three years. Things went well. I didn't want to go into the NFL. I wanted to pursue music. And so I went to Nashville in 1995 to pursue my life's aspiration, which was music. I don't do country music, but I thought it was a great city for me to go to. One of the things that denoted my 10 years in Nashville, though, was that I went there with a goal to record my own music, but I also was 
very hungry for the interior life. And so I would go to daily mass at the cathedral and I would do about 30 to 45 minutes before the Blessed Sacrament. And years ago, Father Kaz from the shrine up in Stockbridge asked me, where did your formation take place? And I didn't really understand the question, but when I shared with him a little bit of my story, he said, well, your formation took place at the cathedral primarily before the Blessed Sacrament. And I think that's a beautiful foreshadowing of where my life has gone today and where I am in my older adult life, so to speak. But really, I like just to say that through the rosary, Our Lady took me by the hand and led me to her son. And it was in Nashville that I really got to know his heart more and more while I was pursuing music. So that's a little bit of a backdrop. And then eventually we moved back to Kansas City. So you kind of completed that phase of your life and loved the music and the what led you to do Sistine films or how did that evolve? Yeah, real quickly, there's an important story happened. So I wrapped up a double disc album in Nashville in 2003. It was an album that I recorded with world renowned greats, uh, the best musicians and Gloria Estefan's Miami Sound Machine and guys from Genesis and the Allman Brothers and guys that were going overseas and conducting the London Symphony and everything. And I really thought that I was going to be, be able to make a run for it. I was playing one of the songs on the album one morning with our son who was three months old, our firstborn. And I literally heard this voice say, you have to set this aside. And because I had spent enough time with the Lord, I unfortunately sensed where the voice was coming from. It wasn't coming from me. And this was my life's aspiration. I had laid everything out to do this. He had blessed this seven year endeavor. How could I set this aside right now? And I fought it and all the momentum that I had experienced the last seven years completely reversed on me. And so eventually this led us to discern moving back to Kansas City to raise um, our family and your family. And I took a job running a commercial print company it was the 46th, uh, I guess you'd call it resume that I sent out. And within a couple of months, I went from having to manage like four people to like a whole team of people, 40 directs, different divisions, inheriting all these problematic areas. And I was very, very, very far removed from the world of artistry that I had left really cast out into the deep to pursue. And and so not to get into that whole thing and not to, you know, over dramatize it, so to speak, but it definitely was and had moments of a dark night, but it was also very purgative for me too. And I look back on that time, it was a time of preparation. The Lord needed me to go through this for various reasons, to be more purified, to be more humbled, to be more open, to hear the call. And we had a lot of companies we served that these owners, architects, engineers, they had great stories. And I had this thought one day that the beautiful materials we were printing for them were one thing, but they really can't capture the power and the beauty of their humanity and the story. And so my simple thought was if we told their story, maybe they would be able to engage with a good fit for their business and be able to share something of their essence and why they're doing what they do and this sort of a thing. And so I pitched it to the company and they didn't like the idea. <clears throat> and at the same time, I knew that I had to make a move. And so make a long story short, some things developed in my life that were pointing towards a possibility of doing film. One of which was I took two weeks vacation and went to the Holy Land in June of 2012 to shoot a documentary. And we don't have time to get into that whole story, but I did do it. And I had a really profound divine mercy moment while I was there. To be on Calvary in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at the three o'clock hour on the Feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus with my professional life in somewhat chaotic turmoil and being there on a trip that I was actually afraid to take, doing something that I had never done before, only God. 
And that's my favorite feast day is the Sacred Heart of Jesus. In any event, that placed in my soul something that I needed to address. A year later, May of 2013, I gave my notice and I started Sistine Films. The name Sistine Films, real quickly, a friend of mine had sent me an image of the top of the chapel where it's the hand of man, the hand of Adam, the hand of God touching each other. And my wife takes everything that I own that doesn't have a home and puts it on top of the refrigerator. So about every three months, when I come walking into the kitchen, the rumble alone causes debris to fall down. Well, this particular day, I was coming in from the garage and I was thinking to myself, Lord, if I started this film production company, would you partner with me? And as I stepped into the kitchen, this image fell down and I picked it up and I'm looking at it and I set it down and I thought, hmm, I looked at this image so many times, I love it, but I never really saw it as God partnering with us. And I thought that was a prayer you just prayed. So in any event, that's kind of where Sistine Films comes from. Yep. And started May of 2013. What's the website uh, for you, Michael, on that? Yeah, just uh, SistineFilms.com. S-I-S-T-I-N-E Films.com. Yeah, um, if we can, we're going to play a trailer, uh, but explain to us the trailer before we... Um, so that I had too much, but basically, let me give a quick summary here. So I'm in my, will be in my 11th year, God willing, this May doing this work. And it's not just that the Lord sets you down a path, but he continues to refine what you do and open your eyes to more and more. So in the beginning, I wasn't doing a lot of Catholic films, but now the majority of films I do are Catholic. But one of the things that's happened is five years ago, I had a really powerful encounter um, doing a series of concert talks up in the National Shrine of Maxima and Colby outside Chicago. And it was on that last day I sensed the Lord trying to tell me something. And so when I got back to town, I decided that I would increase what was my weekly Eucharistic adoration to a couple of times that week. My uncle, um, on Senior Charles McGlynn, who passed away a couple of years ago, was a priest of over 50 years in the Archdiocese, Archdiocese of Kansas City in Kansas, had built a very beautiful adoration room. And so I went there a couple of mornings to discern what the Lord was trying to tell me. I sensed on that last day in, in, uh, at the shrine that he was trying to tell me something. I discerned that, but I was overcome by the beauty of taking time as a busy husband and father of young, of young children and owning a business to go spend time with the Lord in the morning. And so the trailer that we'll show is the trailer for a work that was inspired and brought about by our Lord in there, that my time in adoration wasn't just for me, and it wasn't just for my family, because that framed in my spirituality. This came at a time in my life when I was very weary and heavy. And so something additional came, and that was, you know, I basically I want to tap the talents that I gave you to get the word out. And so the trailer is for a platform that we launched several years ago on January 1st, which is the circumcision of Jesus, the uh, Mary, mother of God, uh, you know, her virginity and even the name of Jesus, like they're all there. And um, it's called adorehimdaily.tv. And so the trailer is for that platform where we use the power of short stories and talks to promote the life-saving benefits of Eucharistic adoration. Well, let's, uh, we'll play that now and we'll watch that and then we'll come back. My name is Michael McGlynn and I'm a storyteller. Do you know what makes a great story? I thought after having produced hundreds of films, interviewed numerous leaders and received awards, I knew. But three years ago, that all changed. It was then that I discovered a story I couldn't believe was not being told. It had all the compelling elements you look for. An unsuspecting hero, internal conflicts and struggles, an insidious enemy full of deception, a trustworthy and generous guide, and one glorious mission critical to the future of others. I know it sounds like a movie, but it wasn't. And the closer I drew, the more it challenged, 
much of what I thought was important. And that's when my eyes opened. Can you imagine for a moment if at the end of your life, you realized that you missed the point and that what you thought was really important was not. As you say over and over again, I had no idea. I just had no idea. As you see all that could have been and was rightfully yours, fade away, never to return. That was the question I couldn't stop thinking about. What if I had never been told? And how could I now remain silent? So in early 2020, I began documenting what was at the heart of not just one, but an entire community of people who were experiencing the opposite of the worry, confusion, and doubt familiar to so many of us. A reality that weighs us down, affects our choices, damages our relationships and families, and drains us of the dreams that came so easily when we were children. Shackling us in fear so that we never attain the joy we and our loved ones were made for. And that's when I knew that I needed to do everything I could to tell this story while there is still time. Do you know what makes a great story? So that trailer gives you an idea of something you did a few years ago. What what are you working on now? So it's really interesting. My work continues to be more about adoration. And adoration, as I've come to discover and understand it by our Lord, really is, is the way of life that we're all called to. It is the narrow path that leads to the eternal glory. How is this? Well, it's the first three commandments you know, love of God, his name, keeping the Sunday Sabbath holy. And my work was already Christocentric. So years ago in doing my work, I started to discover that the Lord sends me into certain organizations and parishes and businesses and even individuals I work with in order to help them refine and glean the Christocentric nature of their work that they've been called to, to proclaim the gospel using the gifts and talents and resources and charisms that they've been provided. And none of this can really be objective on our own. And so my job is to come in and to listen and to help them as an artist, as a Catholic artist. This is one of the reasons why spending time before our Lord has been incredibly fruitful for my work as an artist, because as a filmmaker, as a storyteller, even as a writer, any capacity in my life, my primary office is a husband and a father. My first job is to seek to do God's will. In order to do that, I, I have to listen. I have to, as John the Baptist says, I must decrease so he can increase. And so taking that intentional time to give him margin and to adore him with Our Lady, the effects continue to be so amazing that it's sending a ripple effect into the work I do, the films that I wanna make and the films that he's asked me to make and the people that he sends my way. And it becomes a focal point of, shall I say, at a time where we hear so much about my rights and my freedom to do this or that, I say, what about God's rights? What about the fact that he's owed our adoration as our first cause and our final end? What about him? And so we have to take time to begin to place him in the proper perspective in our lives. And story, film, music, created works, 
can help us move into that space to become open to that message, especially for so many people that haven't heard that or haven't been reminded of it. I was blessed that God reached me and made it possible for me to enter into the power of spending time with him. And I feel a great responsibility, but a wonderful opportunity and gift to be able to try to share that word with others and meet other people that they themselves believe in the power of spending time with our Lord. We follow our lady. So Michael, um, you've done numerous things for the Marians, the current provincial father, Chris Alar. What, what have you done in the past, recent past to uh, help the Marians? Yeah, great question. You know, Dr. Brian, a couple of years ago, they launched a show called Living Divine Mercy, and it airs on EWTN. And they contacted me and asked me to design the show opener. So I got that done. And then they started asking me to go out and do films. And so now I produce these eight minute films that are somewhere located in their 30 minute segment. And they have a number of different field producers like me that do this. But what's really beautiful about it is that all of us are have our own unique sensibilities and talents. And so if you think about like a tapestry, uh, you know, think about 10 different storytellers, we're all going to tell stories a different way and things might suit us a little bit better than another story. And so the shrine has done a really great job of matching us field producers, so to speak, with stories that work well with who we are and, and the type of work we've done. And so I've been doing that for them and it's been fantastic. I was actually just in Stockbridge on December 9th and uh, had an opportunity to do some filming up there uh, and get a chance to talk again with Father Alar and, and uh, Father Kaz and the whole team up there. And my life has been incredibly blessed by this incredible this message of Jesus and his divine mercy. And I know you have as well. So it's a great joy to assist them with films today. Years ago, I flew to Kansas City and spoke with a nun, Sister Andrea. And uh, she had an incredible ministry, a massive warehouse. She had more donations stuff to the gills and and uh, she was shipping containers and just doing incredible work and i had such a small operation but she volunteered to help me and we sent some of her materials to ukraine and uh brazil i think the philippines even and uh she called me some time ago and told me she was retiring but there was a organization project cure taking over her work um share with us where you fit in all this and you you knew sister as well and kind of what's happening on that end right now you know i had an opportunity to meet sister probably eight nine years ago shortly after i started the film business and we actually were going to travel to tanzania to do a film for her and i was sensing that this was going to be a rather treacherous trip to take and then she had a health issue arise and some other things happened and it never happened. But I got to know her and Paul who ran, uh, you know, the Franciscan missionaries warehouse. And so much to my joy, back in September, I was given a new story on, to do on Project Cure who brings supplies all over the world and are located here. But on the first day of production, the director uh, of the, uh, the Kansas City office mentioned to me, now, are you aware of the work that we've done with the Marians? And I was like, no. So I placed a call back to the Marians and found out that there was a lot more to this story than I was aware of. And so it set us on quite a bit of a trail to talk to sister and do lots of interviews and, and even yourself and everything. So I look forward to getting that film out. What was really amazing about that the story is how people are risking their lives to drive under the, the, the cover of dark supplies into the Ukraine. This is a humanitarian crisis. Forget the politics, forget all the other stuff that goes on. The Marian Helpers Association and the donations that people have brought forward have literally brought over millions of dollars worth of supplies 
for babies that are having open heart surgery and doctors that need LED lights because power is out. I mean, it's really, really primal settings to, to do medical work over there. And so that film would be coming out. But when I went to go interview sister Andrea here in Kansas city, it was really beautiful because she started her life off as a teacher going into this order that came from France. And then the Lord began to direct her and she ended up sending all these cargo containers all over the world. And she said to me that, you know, there isn't anything more beautiful than to be open to follow where the Lord leads you and to seek to do his will. And I said, sister, unpack that for me. What does that look like day to day when you're not sure what to do? And she said, you know, Michael, there are times that I did not know what to do and I would do everything I knew to do what I thought was right. And I would hit a wall. And that's what the Lord was asking of me. And then he was asking me to let go and then allow him in. And it reminded me so much of what St. Faustina speaks of in the diary, where she's inspired to do this or that, but she's can't do it because of her tuberculosis or some other situation. And Jesus would appear to her and say, my daughter, it was more pleasing to me that you sought to do this with the purity of intent than if you would have accomplished the very thing that I inspired you to do. Who talks like that today where everything we do has to be measured and perfect and on time and flawless. That's the tip of the iceberg of snuggling close to the sacred heart of Jesus and why it's so important while we're this side of the veil to take time to go linger and remain with our Lord in his real presence, because we will get to know that very heart just as St. Faustina did. But as it relates to us personally, see, when we read the diary, we're reading about another woman's life and her relationship with Jesus and its example of his goodness. But we want to experience that goodness personally as it pertains to the complexities and aspirations and desires that are in our lives and our souls. And I believe that, well, it's not just what I believe, it's what the doctors of the church have said, that all the great saints got adoration and Our Lady consecration and rosary. They got that and they hand that, that's their legacy of faith that they hand on to us outside of the Holy Mass. I feel so grateful that all these pieces continue to be integrated and not uh, working in competition with each other. You know, you mentioned lifting the veil and it reminded me of a quote, Faustinus, that um, I reward more for the effort and not the results. And she wrote in her diary, she wanted to lift the veil and share with everyone about God's great mercy. And, and I think of what you're doing is that same thing, trying to lift the veil off a society that doesn't see what life's all about. You know, we're here to know God, love him and serve him and be with him in the next. Um, if there was one thing on your heart, not that it may ever happen, it may not be God's will, but there's one thing pressing on your heart, one project that you'd love to do, but maybe you don't have the finances or time isn't right. What, do you have any thoughts on that, what it would be? I do. Back, back in 2003, when I heard our Lord say, you have to set this aside, I didn't understand what he meant. It just meant to me, no. And I couldn't understand how this project was so amazingly blessed. I could give a three hour talk on all the things that happened to me over the seven years, miracle upon miracle for this effort to get done. <clears throat> this last summer, I prayed to our Lord in a holy hour that may I have permission to start working on music again, that it continues to well up in me. I've written a little bit over the years, but I just thought it was hands off. He answered me so powerfully that day. And I, in this holy hour, kept hearing this psalm and I finally turned to Our Lady and I said, let the praise of God be high in your throats on the couches. I mean, that's, I can't deny that. Mary, what do I do with this? 
Well, that day I had taken our son to the college that he now attends and we had made it up there for mass and kind of some introductory days. Lo and behold, that was the Psalm at the mass that day. I was in tears. Hmm. So I walked away from there with a big yes, but then it was like, I knew what this looked like 20 years ago. What does this look like now? Now that I'm married and have a family and have a, you know, have a company and, and often I sometimes hear the humor of our Lord. And recently the word kind of came back. Well, the first step is to finish writing the music and get it recorded. <laughs> Don't worry about everything else. And so I have I'm many songs down the road on a, on a new album called something new in me. And the album is much more stripped down than some of the bigger productions I've done uh, just for ease of sake. But that is my action item for this year. Um, I gave a prayer to our Lord and I literally wrote it down on a card and put it in the crib, the little crush we have in our house on Christmas Eve. And it was, Lord, I, I'm going to entrust everything to you this year. Help me to renew this commitment of trust daily on behalf of my love for you, love of souls, and to seek to do the Father's will. But with the clarity in mind in that petition was the fact that this is a talent that I have buried. And I buried it because I didn't always understand how to use it. I would have one-offs and go out and do a talk and do music, but, but ne never taking concentrated time to record. I share that story because it could have been a quick answer back to you for people that might hear this. And that is that it's okay to be unclear. It's okay to not sure how, be how to, you know, how to proceed on certain things that stir in your heart. It's okay that you've engaged into times of long suffering. It's okay. God actually wants us to wrestle with him, so to speak. But when the time is right, he will confirm for us. And it's beautiful. He's not harsh. You know, I was purified all these years to be clear. And I did submit to go into a crucible that I didn't want to go into. I have absolutely zero doubts in my mind about the focus of spending time on these songs, which are really intended to, as you say, pull the veil back on the real presence of our Lord, where Our Lady is, and to try to use this gift of mine to maybe help open someone to whom they might be missing daily who adores us as well in a certain sense. And so that's, that's uh, my little side goal project for this year. Well, Michael, I wanna thank you for joining me today for Mercy Unbound. Uh, you can just sense your heart's in the right place, you, your love of God and the Blessed Mother Jesus and, and uh, adoration. And I certainly wish you all the best. And uh, people go look at sistinefilms.com uh, if you can help Michael out, please do so. Uh, if you've got any projects down the road that you could use Michael's talents, uh, please do so. And uh, God bless you, Michael. And we hope to have you back soon on Mercy Unbound. Dr. Thatcher, it's great being with you. Thank you so much. God bless you and your work and, and all the people that will hear this. As we enter into this new year, it is a time to lean into our Lord and our Lady like we never have been before and to be available to them to do the work of reparation, to do the work that brings glory back to God. And as a St. Peter Julian Imard said, the great priest of the Eucharist, when Eucharistic adorers become numerous around our divine chief, God will be glorified and society will become Christian conquered for Jesus Christ by the apostolate of Eucharistic prayer where Our Lady is at the foot of the cross. Amen. And one of my quotes from him I love is, may thy Eucharistic kingdom come. So bring it on, Jesus. So, Michael, thanks again, people. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please share and subscribe and uh, look forward to seeing you next time on Mercy Unbound. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel for the video portion. The podcast can be heard at anchor.fm slash drbryan, B-R-Y-A-N, Thatcher, T-H-A-T-C-H-E-R and on all the major podcast forums. I would love to speak at your church or conference, and please consider supporting our efforts to spread the truth to a hurting world. Thank you again. 
And for more information, go to the website at drbrianthatcher.com.